Section eighty two of Curiosities of Literature, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume two by Isaac Disraeli of cook's style and his conduct this great lawyer perhaps set the example of that style of railing and invective in the courts which the egotism and craven insolence of some of our lawyers include in their practice at the bar it may be useful to bring to recollection cook's vituperative style in the following dialogue so beautiful in its contrast with that of the great victim before him the attorney-general had not sufficient evidence to bring the obscure conspiracy home to raleigh with which i believe however he had cautiously tampered but cook well knew that james i had reason to dislike the hero of his age who was early engaged against the scottish interests and betrayed by the ambidextrous policy of cecil cook struck at raleigh as a sacrifice to his own political ambition as we have seen he afterwards immolated his daughter but his personal hatred was now sharpened by the fine genius and elegant literature of the man faculties and acquisitions the lawyer so heartily contemned cook had observed i know with whom i deal for we have to deal to-day with a man of wit cook thou art the most vile and execrable traitor that ever lived raleigh you speak indiscreetly barbarously and uncivilly cook i want words sufficient to express thy viperous treason raleigh i think you want words indeed for you have spoken one thing half a dozen times cook thou art an odious fellow thy name is hateful to all the realm of england for thy pride raleigh it will go near to prove a measuring cast between you and me mr attorney cook well i will now make it appear to the world that there never lived a viler viper upon the face of the earth than thou thou art a monster thou hast an english face but a spanish heart thou viper for i thou thee thou traitor have i angered you raleigh replied what his dauntless conduct proved i am in no case to be angry cook had used the same style with the unhappy favourite of elizabeth the earl of essex it was usual with him the bitterness was in his own heart as much as in his words and lord bacon has left among his memorandums one entitled of the abuse i received of mr attorney-general publicly in the exchequer a specimen will complete our model of his forensic oratory cook exclaimed mr bacon if you have any tooth against me pluck it out for it will do you more hurt than all the teeth in your head will do you good bacon replied the less you speak of your own greatness the more i will think of it cook replied i think scorn to stand upon terms of greatness towards you who are less than little less than the least cook was exhibited on the stage for his ill usage of raleigh as was suggested by theobald in a note on twelfth night this style of railing was long the privilege of the lawyers it was revived by judge jeffreys but the bench of judges in the reign of william and anne taught a due respect even to criminals who were not supposed to be guilty till they were convicted when cook once was himself in disgrace his high spirits sunk without a particle of magnanimity to dignify the fall his big words and his tyrannical courses when he could no longer exult that he was upon his wings again sunk with him as he presented himself on his knees to the council table among other assumptions he had styled himself lord chief justice of england when it was declared that this title was his own invention since he was no more than of the king's bench his disgrace was a thunderbolt which overthrew the haughty lawyer to the roots when the supersedious was carried to him by sir george coppin that gentleman was surprised on presenting it to see that lofty spirit shrunk into a very narrow room 
for cook received it with dejection and tears the writer from whose letter i have copied these words adds o tremor et suspiria non sadunt in fortem et sonstantum the same writer encloses a punning distich the name of our lord chief justice was in his day very provocative of the pun both in latin and english cicero indeed had preoccupied the miserable trifle Jus sandiri sosis potuit sed sandiri jura non potuit potuit sandiri jura sosis six years afterwards cook was sent to the tower and then they punned against him in english an unpublished letter of the day has this curious anecdote the room in which he was lodged in the tower had formerly been a kitchen on his entrance the lord chief justice read upon the door this room wants a cook they twitched the lion in the toils which held him shenstone had some reason in thanking heaven that his name was not susceptible of a pun this time however cook was on his wings for when lord arundel was sent by the king to the prisoner to inform him that he would be allowed eight of the best learned in the law to advise him for his cause our great lawyer thanked the king but he knew himself to be accounted to have as much skill in the law as any man in england and therefore needed no such help nor feared to be judged by the law End of section eighty two section eighty three of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli secret history of authors who have ruined their booksellers aulus gellius desired to live no longer than he was able to exercise the faculty of writing he might have decently added and of finding readers this would be a fatal wish for that writer who should spread the infection of weariness without himself partaking of the epidemia the mere act and habit of writing without probably even a remote view of publication has produced an agreeable delirium and perhaps some have escaped from a gentle confinement by having cautiously concealed those voluminous reveries which remain to startle their heirs while others again have left a whole library of manuscripts out of the mere ardour of transcription collecting and copying with peculiar rapture i discovered that one of these inscribed this distich on his manuscript collection plura voluminibus jung genda volumina nostris nec mihi scribendi terminus ulus erit which not to compose better verses than our original may be translated more volumes with our volumes still shall blend and to our writing there shall be no end but even great authors have sometimes so much indulged in the seduction of the pen that they appear to have found no substitute for the flow of their ink and the delight of stamping blank paper with their hints sketches ideas the shadows of their mind petrarch exhibits no solitary instance of this passion of the pen i read and i write night and day it is my only consolation my eyes are heavy with watching my hand is weary with writing on the table where i dine and by the side of my bed i have all the materials for writing and when i awake in the dark i write although i am unable to read the next morning what i have written petrarch was not always in his perfect senses the copiousness and the multiplicity of the writings of many authors have shown that too many find a pleasure in the act of composition which they do not communicate to others great erudition and everyday application is the calamity of that voluminous author who without good sense and what is more rare without that exquisite judgment which we call good taste is always prepared to write on any subject but at the same time on no one reasonably 
at the early period of printing two of the most eminent printers were ruined by the volumes of one author we have their petition to the pope to be saved from bankruptcy nicholas de lira had inveigled them to print his interminable commentary on the bible their luckless star prevailed and their warehouse groaned with eleven hundred ponderous folios as immovable as the shelves on which they for ever reposed we are astonished at the fertility and the size of our own writers of the seventeenth century when the theological war of words raged spoiling so many pages and brains they produced folio after folio like almanacs and dr owen and baxter wrote more than sixty to seventy volumes most of them of the most formidable size the truth is however that it was then easier to write up to a folio than in our days to write down to an octavo for correction selection and rejection were arts as yet unpractised they went on with their work sharply or bluntly like witless mowers without stopping to wet their scythes they were inspired by the scribbling demon of that rabbin who in his oriental style and mania of volume exclaimed that were the heavens formed of paper and were the trees of the earth pens and if the entire sea run ink these only could suffice for the monstrous genius he was about to discharge on the world the spanish tostadas wrote three times as many leaves as the number of days he had lived and of lopa de vega it is said that this calculation came rather short we hear of another who was unhappy that his lady had produced twins from the circumstance that hitherto he had contrived to pair his labours with her own but that now he was a book behindhand i fix on four celebrated scribleri to give their secret history our prin gaspar barthius the abbe de marol and the jesuit theophilus raynaud who will all show that a book might be written on authors whose works have ruined their booksellers prin seldom dined every three or four hours he munched a manchet and refreshed his exhausted spirits with ale brought to him by his servant and when he was put into this road of writing as crabbed anthony telleth he fixed on a long quilted cap which came an inch over his eyes serving as an umbrella to defend them from too much light and then hunger nor thirst did he experience save that of his voluminous pages prin has written a library amounting i think to nearly two hundred books our unlucky author whose life was involved in authorship and his happiness no doubt in the habitual exuberance of his pen seems to have considered the being debarred from pen ink and books during his imprisonment as an act more barbarous than the loss of his ears Footnote prin was condemned for his history of mastics a book against actors and acting in which he had indulged in severe remarks on female performers and henrietta maria having frequently personated parts in court masks the offensive words were declared to have been levelled at her he was condemned to fine and imprisonment was pilloried at westminster and cheapside and had an ear cut off at each place in the footnote the extraordinary perseverance of prin in this fever of the pen appears in the following title of one of his extraordinary volumes comfortable cordials against discomfortable fears of imprisonment containing some latin verses sentences and texts of scripture written by mr william prin on his chamber walls in the tower of london during his imprisonment there translated by him into english verse sixteen forty one prin literally verified pope's description is there who locked from ink and paper scrawls with desperate charcoal round his darkened walls we have also a catalogue of printed books written by william prin esq of lincoln's inn in these classes before during and since his imprisonment with this motto you sunday acti laboris sixteen forty three the secret history of this voluminous author concludes with a characteristic event 
our contemporary who saw prynne in the pillory at cheapside informs us that while he stood there they burnt his huge volumes under his nose which had almost suffocated him yet such was the spirit of party that a puritanic sister bequeathed a legacy to purchase all the works of prynne for sion college where many still repose for by an odd fatality in the fire which happened in that library these volumes were saved from the idea that folios were the most valuable footnote prynne who ultimately quarrelled with the puritans was made keeper of the records of the tower by charles the second who was advised thereto by men who did not know how else to keep busy mr prynne out of political pamphleteering he went to the work of investigation with avidity and it was while so employed that he followed the mode of life narrated in the preceding page End of footnote the pleasure which authors of this stamp experience is of a nature which whenever certain unlucky circumstances combine positively debarring them from publication will not abate their ardour one jot and their pen will still luxuriate in the forbidden page which even booksellers refuse to publish many instances might be recorded but a very striking one is the case of gaspar barthius whose adversaria in two volumes folio are in the collections of the curious barthius was born to literature for baillet has placed him among his enfants célèbres at nine years of age he recited by heart all the comedies of terence without missing a line the learned admired the puerile prodigy while the prodigy was writing books before he had a beard he became unquestionably a student of very extensive literature modern as well as ancient such was his devotion to a literary life that he retreated from the busy world it appears that his early productions were composed more carefully and judiciously than his latter ones when the passion for voluminous writing broke out which showed itself by the usual prognostic of this dangerous disease extreme facility of composition and a pride and exultation in this unhappy faculty he studied without using collections or references trusting to his memory which was probably an extraordinary one though it necessarily led him into many errors in that delicate task of animadverting on other authors writing a very neat hand his first copy required no transcript and he boasts that he rarely made a correction everything was sent to the press in its first state he laughs at statius who congratulated himself that he employed only two days in composing the epithalamium upon stella containing two hundred and seventy-eight hexameters this says barthius did not quite lay him open to horace's censure of the man who made two hundred verses in an hour stands pede in uno not as barthius but that i think the censure of horace too hyperbolical for i am not ignorant what it is to make a great number of verses in a short time and in three days i translated into latin the three first books of the iliad which amount to above two thousand verses thus rapidity and volume were the great enjoyments of this learned man's pen and now we must look to the fruits barthius on the system he had adopted seems to have written a whole library a circumstance which we discover by the continual references he makes in his printed works to his manuscript productions in the index authorum to his statius he inserts his own name to which is appended a long list of unprinted works which bayle thinks by their titles and extracts conveys a very advantageous notion of them all these and many such as these he generously offered the world would any bookseller be intrepid or courteous enough to usher them from his press but their cowardice or incivility was intractable the truth is now to be revealed and seems not to have been known to bayle the booksellers had been formerly so cajoled and complimented by our learned author and had heard so much of the celebrated barthius that they had caught at the bait and that the two folio volumes of the much referred to adversaria of barthius had thus been published but from that day no bookseller ever offered himself to publish again the adversaria is a collection of critical notes and quotations from ancient authors with illustrations of their manners customs laws and ceremonies all these were to be classed into one hundred and eighty books sixty of which we possess in two volumes folio with eleven indexes the plan is vast as the rapidity with which it was pursued 
bayle finally characterizes it by a single stroke its immensity tires even the imagination but the truth is this mighty labor turned out to be a complete failure there was neither order nor judgment in these masses of learning crude obscure and contradictory such as we might expect from a man who trusted to his memory and would not throw away his time on any correction his contradictions are flagrant but one of his friends would apologize for these by telling us that he wrote everything which offered itself to his imagination to-day one thing to-morrow another in order that when he should revise it again this contrariety of opinion might induce him to examine the subject more accurately the notions of the friends of authors are as extravagant as those of their enemies barthius evidently wrote so much that often he forgot what he had written as happened to another great bookman one didymus of whom quintilian records that on hearing a certain history he treated it as utterly unworthy of credit on which the teller called for one of didymus's own books and showed where he might read it at full length that the work failed we have the evidence of clement in his bibliothèque curieuse de livre difficile à trouver under the article of barthius where we discover the winding up of the history of this book clement mentions more than one edition of the adversaria but on a more careful inspection he detected that the old title pages had been removed for others of a fresher date the booksellers not being able to sell the book practised this deception it availed little they remained with their unsold edition of the two first volumes of the adversaria and the author with three thousand folio sheets and manuscript while both parties complained together and their heirs could acquire nothing from the works of an author of whom bayle says that his writings rise to such a prodigious bulk that one can scarce conceive a single man could be capable of executing so great a variety perhaps no copying clerk who lived to grow old amidst the dust of an office ever transcribed as much as this author has written this was the memorable fate of one of that race of writers who imagine that their capacity extends with their volume their land seems covered with fertility but in shaking their wheat no ears fall another memorable brother of this family of the scribleri is the abbe de moreau who with great ardour as a man of letters and in the enjoyment of the leisure and opulence so necessary to carry on his pursuits from an entire absence of judgment closed his life with the bitter regrets of a voluminous author and yet it cannot be denied that he has contributed one precious volume to the public stock of literature a compliment which cannot be paid to some who have enjoyed a higher reputation than our author he has left us his very curious memoirs a poor writer indeed but the frankness and intrepidity of his character enable him while he is painting himself to paint man gibbon was struck by the honesty of his pen for he says in his life the dullness of michael de Marolles and anthony wood footnote i cannot subscribe to the opinion that anthony wood was a dull man although he had no particular liking for works of imagination and used ordinary poets scurvily an author's personal character is often confounded with the nature of his work anthony has sallies at times to which a dull man could not be subject without the ardour of this hermit of literature where would be our literary history End of footnote acquire some value from the faithful representation of men and manners i have elsewhere shortly noticed the abbe de marolles in the character of a literary sinner but the extent of his sins never struck me so forcibly as when i observed his delinquencies counted up in chronological order in niceron's umsilustra it is extremely amusing to detect the swarming fecundity of his pen from year to year with author after author was this translator wearying others but remained himself unwearied sometimes two or three classical victims in a season were dragged into his slaughter-house of about seventy works fifty were versions of the classical writers of antiquity accompanied with notes but some odd circumstances happened to our extraordinary translator in the course of his life de l'etang a critic of that day in his regles de bien traduire drew all his examples of bad translation from our abbe who was more angry than usual and among his circle the cries of our marsyas resounded 
de l'etang who had done this not out of malice but from urgent necessity to illustrate his principles seemed very sorry and was desirous of appeasing the angry translator one day in easter finding the abbe in church at prayers the critic fell on his knees by the side of the translator it was an extraordinary moment and a singular situation to terminate a literary quarrel you are angry with me said de l'etang and i think you have reason but this is a season of mercy and i now ask your pardon in the manner replied the abbe which you have chosen i can no longer defend myself go sir i pardon you some days after the abbe again meeting de l'etang reproached him with duping him out of a pardon which he had no desire to have bestowed on him the last reply of the critic was caustic do not be so difficult when one stands in need of a general pardon one ought surely to grant a particular one de marolles was subject to encounter critics who were never so kind as to kneel by him on an easter sunday besides these fifty translations of which the notes are often curious and even the sense may be useful to consult his love of writing produced many odd works his volumes were richly bound and freely distributed but they found no readers in a discours pour servir de préface sur les poètes traduit par michel de morel he has given an imposing list of illustrious persons and contemporary authors who were his friends and has preserved many singular facts concerning them he was indeed for so long a time convinced that he had struck off the true spirit of his fine originals that i find he had several times printed some critical treatise to back his last or usher in his new version giving the world reasons why the versions which had been given of that particular author soit en prose soit en vers ont été si pon approuvés jusqu'ici among these numerous translations he was the first who ventured on the dipanosophists of athenaeus which still bears an excessive price he entitles his work les quinze livres de dipanosophistes d'athenae ouvrage délicieux agréablement diversifié et rempli de narrations scavant sur tout sort de matière et de sujets he has prefixed various preliminary dissertations yet not satisfied with having performed this great labour it was followed by a small quarto of forty pages which might now be considered curious analyse en description succinct des choses en continu dans les quinze livres de nipnosophis he wrote quatrain sur les passants de la cour et les gens de lettres which the curious would now be glad to find after having plundered the classical geniuses of antiquity by his barbarous style when he had nothing more left to do he committed sacrilege in translating the bible but in the midst of printing he was suddenly stopped by authority for having inserted in his notes the reveries of the pre-adamite isaac Pevere he had already revelled on the new testament to his version of which he had prefixed so sensible an introduction that it was afterwards translated into latin translation was the mania of the abbe de morole i doubt whether he ever fairly awoke out of the heavy dream of the felicity of his translations for late in life i find him observing i have employed much time in study and i have translated many books considering this rather as an innocent amusement which i have chosen for my private life than as things very necessary although they are not entirely useless some have valued them and others have cared little about them but however it may be i see nothing which obliges me to believe that they contain not at least as much good as bad both for their own matter and the form which i have given to them the notion he entertained of his translations was their closeness he was not aware of his own spiritless style and he imagined that poetry only consisted in the thoughts not in grace and harmony of verse he insisted that by giving the public his numerous translations he was not vainly multiplying books because he neither diminished nor increased their ideas in his faithful versions he had a curious notion that some were more scrupulous than they ought to be respecting translations of authors who living so many ages past are rarely read from the difficulty of understanding them and why should they imagine that a translation is injurious to them or would occasion the utter neglect of the originals 
we do not think so highly of our own works says the indefatigable and modest abbe but neither do i despair that they may be useful even to these scrupulous persons i will not suppress the truth while i am noticing these ungrateful labours if they have given me much pain by my assiduity they have repaid me by the fine things they have taught me and by the opinion which i have conceived that posterity more just than the present times will award a more favourable judgment thus a miserable translator terminates his long labours by drawing his bill of fame on posterity which his contemporaries will not pay but in these cases as the bill is certainly lost before it reaches acceptance why should we deprive the drawers of pleasing themselves with the ideal capital let us not however imagine that the abbe de moreau was nothing but the man he appears in the character of a voluminous translator though occupied all his life on these miserable labours he was evidently an ingenious and nobly minded man whose days were consecrated to literary pursuits and who was among the primitive collectors in europe of fine and curious prints one of his works is a catalogue des livres des temps et des figures en taille douce paris sixteen sixty six in octavo in the preface our author declares that he had collected one hundred and twenty three thousand four hundred prints of six thousand masters in four hundred large volumes and one hundred and twenty small ones this magnificent collection formed by so much care and skill he presented to the king whether gratuitously given or otherwise it was an acquisition which a monarch might have thankfully accepted such was the habitual ardour of our author that afterwards he set about forming another collection of which he has also given a catalogue in sixteen seventy two in duodecimo both these catalogues of prints are of extreme rarity and are yet so highly valued by the connoisseurs that when in france i could never obtain a copy a long life may be passed without even a sight of the catalogue des livres des temps of the abbe de moreau Footnote these two catalogues have always been of extreme rarity in price dr lister when at paris sixteen sixty eight notices this circumstance i have since met with them in the very curious collections of my friend mr deuce who has uniques as well as rarities the monograms of our old masters in one of these catalogues are more correct than in some later publications and the whole plan and arrangement of these catalogues of prints are peculiar and interesting End of footnote. such are the lessons drawn from this secret history of voluminous writers we see one venting his mania in scrawling on his prison walls another persisting in writing folios while the booksellers who were once caught like reynard who had lost his tail and whom no arts could any longer practise on turn away from the new trap and a third who can acquire no readers but by giving his books away growing grey and scourging the sacred genius of antiquity by his meagre versions and dying without having made up his mind whether he were as woeful a translator as some of his contemporaries had assured him among these worthies of the scribleri we may rank the jesuit theophilus reynaud once a celebrated name eulogized by bayle and patin his collected works fill twenty folios an edition indeed which finally sent the bookseller to the poorhouse this enterprising bibliopolist had heard much of the prodigious erudition of the writer but he had not the sagacity to discover that other literary qualities were also required to make twenty folios at all saleable of these opera omnia perhaps not a single copy can be found in england but they may be a pennyworth on the continent reynaud's work are theological but a system of grace maintained by one work and pulled down by another has ceased to interest mankind the literature of the divine is of a less perishable nature reading and writing through a life of eighty years and giving only a quarter of an hour to his dinner with a vigorous memory and a whimsical taste for some singular subjects he could not fail to accumulate a mass of knowledge which may still be useful for the curious and besides reynaud had the ritsonian characteristic he was one of those who exemplary in their own conduct with a bitter zeal condemn whatever does not agree with their own notions and however gentle in their nature yet will set no limits to the ferocity of their pen 
raynaud was often in trouble with the censors of his books and much more with his adversaries so that he frequently had recourse to publishing under a fictitious name a remarkable evidence of this is the entire twentieth volume of his works it consists of the numerous writings published anonymously or to which were prefixed nom de guerre this volume is described by the whimsical title of apopompeius explained to us as the name given by the jews to the scapegoat which when loaded with all their maledictions on its head was driven away into the desert these contain all raynaud's numerous diatribes for whenever he was refuted he was always refuting he did not spare his best friends the title of a work against arnaud will show how he treated his adversaries arnoldus redivivus natus brixie sessula duodecim renatus in galae etata nostra he dexterously applies the name of arnold by comparing him with one of the same name in the twelfth century a scholar of abelard's and a turbulent enthusiast say the romish writers who was burnt alive for having written against the luxury and the power of the priesthood and for having raised a rebellion against the pope when the learned de lonoy had successfully attacked the legends of saints and was called the denesure de saint the unnicher of saints every parish priest trembled for his favourite raynaud entitled a libel on this new iconoclast hercule commodianus johannes lanoas repulsus etc he compares lanois to the emperor commodus who though the most cowardly of men conceived himself formidable when he dressed himself as hercules another of these maledictions is a tract against calvinism described as a religio bestiarum a religion of beasts because the calvinists deny free will but as he always fired with a double-barrelled gun under the cloak of attacking calvinism he aimed a deadly shot at the thomists and particularly at a dominican friar whom he considered as bad as calvin raynaud exults that he had driven one of his adversaries to take flight into scotland ad pultus scoticus transgressus to a scotch pottage an expression which st jerome used in speaking of pelagius he always rendered an adversary odious by coupling him with some odious name on one of these controversial books where sassalus refuted raynaud manoir wrote renaudus et sassalus inepti renaudo tamen sassalus ineptior the usual termination of what then passed for sense and now is the reverse i will not quit raynaud without pointing out some of his more remarkable treatises as so many curiosities of literature in a treatise on the attributes of christ he entitles a chapter christus bonus bona bonum in another on the seven branch candlestick in the jewish temple by an allegorical interpretation he explains the eucharist and adds an alphabetical list of names and epithets which have been given to this mystery the seventh volume bears the title of mariolia all the treatises have for their theme the perfections and the worship of the virgin many extraordinary things are here one is a dictionary of names given to the virgin with observations on these names another on the devotion of the scapulary and its wonderful effects written against de la noix and for which the order of the carmus when he died bestowed a solemn service and obsequies on him another of these mariolia is mentioned by galois in the journal des scavants sixteen sixty seven as a proof of his fertility having to preach on the seven solemn anthems which the church sings before christmas and which begin by an o he made this letter only the subject of his sermons and barren as the letter appears he has struck out a multitude of beautiful particulars this literary folly invites our curiosity in the eighth volume is a table of saints classed by their station condition employment and trades a list of titles and prerogatives which the councils and the fathers have attributed to the sovereign pontiff the thirteenth volume has a subject which seems much in the taste of the sermons on the letter o it is entitled laus brevitatis in praise of brevity the maxims are brief but the commentary long one of the natural subjects treated on is that of noses he reviews a great number of noses and as usual does not forget the holy virgins 
according to raynaud the nose of the virgin mary was long and aquiline the mark of goodness and dignity and as jesus perfectly resembled his mother he infers that he must have had such a nose a treatise entitled heteroclita spiritualia et anomala pietatis celestium terrestrium et infernorum contains many singular practices introduced into devotion which superstition ignorance and remissness have made a part of religion a treatise directed against the new custom of hiring chairs in churches and being seated during the sacrifice of the mass another on the caesarian operation which he stigmatizes as an act against nature another on eunuchs another entitled hipparchus de religioso negotiaratore is an attack on those of his own company the monk turned merchant the jesuits were then accused of commercial traffic with the revenues of their establishment the rector of a college at avignon who thought he was portrayed in this honest work confined raynaud in prison for five months the most curious work of raynaud connected with literature i possess it is entitled eratamata de malis ac bonus libris deque justa aut in justa e orundem confixione luduni sixteen fifty three quarto with necessary indexes one of his works having been condemned at rome he drew up these inquiries concerning good and bad books addressed to the grand inquisitor he divides his treatise into bad and nocent books bad books but not nocent books not bad but nocent books neither bad nor nocent his immense reading appears here to advantage and his ritsonian feature is prominent for he asserts that when writing against heretics all mordacity is ignoxious and an alphabetical list of abusive names which the fathers have given to the heterodox is entitled alphabetum bestiar litatis hey ex patrum symbolis after all raynaud was a man of vast acquirement with a great flow of ideas but tasteless and void of all judgment an anecdote may be recorded of him which puts in a clear light the state of these literary men raynaud was one day pressing hard a reluctant bookseller to publish one of his works who replied write a book like father barry's and i shall be glad to print it it happened that the work of barry was pillaged from raynaud and was much liked while the original lay on the shelf however this only served to provoke a fresh attack from our redoubtable hero who vindicated his rights and emptied his quiver on him who had been ploughing with his heifer such are the writers who enjoying all the pleasures without the pains of composition have often apologized for their repeated productions by declaring that they write only for their own amusement but such private theatricals should not be brought on the public stage one catherino all his life was printing a countless number of fouille volantes in history and on antiquities each consisting of about three or four leaves in quarto l'anglais du fresnoir calls him grand autour des petits livres this gentleman liked to live among antiquaries and historians but with a crooked headpiece stuck with whims and hard with knotty combinations all overloaded with prodigious erudition he could not ease it at a less rate than by an occasional dissertation of three or four quarto pages he appears to have published about two hundred pieces of this sort much sought after by the curious for their rarity brunet complains he could never discover a complete collection but catherino may escape the pains and penalties of our voluminous writers for de bure thinks he generously printed them to distribute among his friends such endless writers provided they do not print themselves into an almshouse may be allowed to print themselves out and we would accept the apology which m catherino has framed for himself which i find preserved in berry memoriae liberorum rariorum i must be allowed my freedom in my studies for i substitute my writings for a game at the tennis court or a club at the tavern i never counted among my honours these opuscula of mine but merely as harmless amusements it is my partridge as with st john the evangelist my cat as with pope st gregory my little dog as with st dominic my lamb as with st francis my great black mastiff as with cornelius agrippa and my tame hare as with eustace lipsius 
i have since discovered in niceron that this catherino could never get a printer and was rather compelled to study economy in his two hundred quartos of four or eight pages his paper was of inferior quality and when he could not get his dissertations into his prescribed number of pages he used to promise the end at another time which did not always happen but his greatest anxiety was to publish and spread his works in despair he adopted an odd expedient whenever m catherineau came to paris he used to haunt the quays where books are sold and while he appeared to be looking over them he adroitly slided one of his own dissertations among these old books he began this mode of publication early and continued it to his last days he died with a perfect conviction that he had secured his immortality and in this manner had disposed of more than one edition of his unsaleable works niceron has given the titles of one hundred and eighteen of his things which he had looked over end of section eighty three end of curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli